Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Tony Hoare. Um, I think you all know Tony from, uh, from his work, but let me just mention a couple of more recent things. One of which is that he just um, came from receiving the um, uh, prestigious um, John von Neumann Award, um, which uh, for uh, his contributions to, to software design. And uh, he just told me also that he, is that he is going to receive a SIGPLAN Lifetime Achievement Award in, in January as well. So uh, without any further ado, let me <laughs> give it to Tony. One more chair. One more chair I've just vacated. Any, <laughs> anybody like to sit in my seat? Well, thank you very much for this invitation. I've um, arrived in, in uh, Redmond yes, uh, yesterday, and I've, well, I've very much enjoyed, enjoyed my visit so far. I hope you'll continue that tradition. Thank you. Um, the algebra of concurrent programming, I've uh, become interested in concurrent programming in its, more, in its wider aspects um, in, in recent years with the advent of the multi-core computer. Um, I previously have worked in concurrent programming on the model of disjoint uh, communicating processors. Uh, so in both cases, the development of my thinking has been triggered by the opportunities offered by the hardware. But what, what I, my real ambition uh, now is to uh, try to unify the ideas that are relevant for reasoning about concurrency in both, uh, both I say, all its forms, um, at least as many as I can think of, and to um, uh, present the results of the speculations in the form of an algebra um, that is, uh, appeals to human ability and human experience um, and maybe even interest in the use of algebraic manipulations to reason about uh, mathematics, arithmetic, and now about programs as well. Um, of course, the see what I mean. The um, ideas that I have I will present I have stolen um, bare, barefacedly from a number of uh, other people, uh, many of them interns at. Microsoft in Cambridge. Um, algebra. Um, algebra uses variables to stand for something. Um, and if I were a pure mathematician, I wouldn't worry what they stood for at all. But as an applied mathematician, and I expect most of you belong to that category, it's helpful to know at least one of the things that the variables of your algebra are standing for. And I'm going to um, tell you that my intention is that they should stand for computer programs, computer program designs, and computer program specifications. Um, I'm, not, I'm deliberately not going to say which of those I'm talking about at any given time, because I want to concentrate on their similarities rather than their differences. All three describe what happens inside and around a computer that executes a given program. Um, and of the three kinds of description, the program itself is the most precise in the sense that um, if the program it doesn't say exactly what's going to happen, at least it delimits de entirely the limited freedom that the implementer has in implementing the program in different ways. So the program can be non-deterministic, but nevertheless, it's the most precise description you can get of what the computer is going to do when it executes the program. Specification, one would like that to be the most abstract, describing only those parts of the behavior of the program that are, are of interest to its user, and providing perhaps some means by which the user can predict and even control uh, what that program is going to do. And designs are sort of somewhere in between. They come between the 
Um, they, they are more specific than the specification, but perhaps less specific than the eventual program is going to be, uh, the program that implements the design. Here are some examples of uh, program specifications and there's all designs. Um, I'm going to I've formulated them all as statements ab about the executions of the program. So the concept of a post condition is probably fairly familiar with you. A post condition describes all programs which actually meet that post condition. Or shall we say the execution of all programs that meet that post condition. And so it is an assertion, a statement, a description of um, all executions that end with a given array <coughs> sorted, for example. Um, quite often we reason with conditional correctness, and that is, um, uh, can be uh, a description uh, which is conditional on the ending of the execution. If the execution ends, it ends with A sorted. But it doesn't say that the execution will necessarily end. Perhaps the execution will be infinite. Precondition is very similar. It describes uh, all executions which start with that precondition true. So, for example, execution starts with x even. And a program, last we come to, something like x becomes x plus 1, describes all executions in which the final value of x is 1 greater than the initial value. Here are some uh, examples which are uh, slightly more wide-ranging, and they deal with aspects of correctness of a program which go beyond uh, what can be expressed simply by um, assertions or assertional reasoning. Uh, the safety uh, uh, um, condition, which I know Microsoft has been very interested in, is the statement, the description of all programs that have no buffer overflows. Termination, some for an algorithm, one wants the algorithm to terminate, and therefore the specification would say that execution is finite, it always ends. On the other hand, for an operating system, you want the opposite uh, specification, um, that there is no infinite amount of internal activity in your program which could prevent it from um, giving you a, uh, a response uh, to um, an external stimulus. No live lock, in other words. Uh, fairness. Um, I've uh, tended to rather um, downplay the issue of fairness in specifications, but um, in general there's no reason why we shouldn't regard fair executions as one of the things that we want and that we want to describe by means of a specification. A fairness a criterion like no response so a response is always given eventually to each request. And finally, even probability. Um, you can describe executions in which the ratio, ratio of A's to B's, uh, tends to one with time. So over a long period of time, you'd expect an equal number of A's and B's. Now, that's just, those are just examples. Um, but the idea that one should use the same conceptual framework for programs and specifications and assertions and designs is such a, I, I have found such a novel one uh, to, not so much to me, but, but to most audiences that I've spoken to, that I'd like to justify uh, it um, briefly. Um, the point is really just to save effort and also to unify in general. Um, the concepts and reduce the number of concepts that we need uh, to understand our particular branch of science. Uh, so as a result of this kind of unification, we can apply the same laws, same algebraic laws, same reasoning methods, the same theorems to programs, to designs, and to specifications. We don't need three different branches of our subject to deal with those three um, important um, uh, phenomena. Another thing is that the same laws are going to be reusable for many kinds of correctness. Assertional correctness, fairness, probability um, have usually been dealt with by separate branches of our subject with their own axioms and their own reasoning methods um, 
we can, uh, if we succeed in this unification, we will be able to apply the same laws to reasoning about every, uh, for, well, many forms of correctness. And that's important uh, too uh, if we are building tools because we'd like to be able to use the same tools for many different purposes. Not a special purpose tool for dealing with fairness. Um, well, that's the ideal. Um, clearly, when one comes to actually build these tools, you find that uh, in order to make them um, reasonably efficient, you need to specialize them uh, to particular kinds of problem, uh, particular kinds of application. And th that is uh, very fair. But the important thing is that whatever specialization you do, you do it as part of a framework in which all the tools can play together. So there is a common grounding of um, ideas and concepts that can be built in to the interfaces between the tools and make sure that there is no mismatch uh, um, as a project moves from one phase to another or as your programs um, sub-programs are used in different contexts. Uh, it's understood um, how to uh, link those together. It doesn't require a vast um, engineering enterprise uh, to try to somehow adapt the interfaces after they have been cast in concrete. Now, I don't want to be... Um, could somebody get me a bottle of water or something, please? I have failed to provide myself with that. Um, thank you, Rostam. <laughs> Now, I don't want to be religious about this, um, but uh, basically my strategy is um, to unify things first and then, if necessary, to make distin distinctions after I know enough about the subject to realize that the distinctions are going to be um, desirable or uh, important or necessary. Um, and so... Um, the distinctions are made within a common framework, within a common family framework. Thank you very much. I'm always forgetting. Ah, oh, great. <laughs> and when the need for them is apparent, we will be able to motivate why the distinction is made. Very often by showing what additional laws we can get by making the distinction. Um, now, um, the basic, con basic laws which um, I'm going to develop are based on the concept of refinement. Refinement between, um, between the, uh, our um, objects of discourse. Um, and I can explain refinement as more or less uh, that Everything, every aspect of the execution described by the left-hand side of this refinement symbol is also described by the right-hand side, Q. And it applies equally in, in all combinations of cases that I've uh, uh, described. Um, if we prove that a specification Im implies a specification, uh, P, sorry, if P implies Q as specifications, this uh, certainly means that any implementation of P implies any implementation, um, uh, sorry, it also satisfies uh, the specification Q. If the program P satisfies Q, that's a normal definition of correctness. If a program P is more determinate than a program Q, that also um, the, the executions which it can evoke are a subset of those which are described by Q, and that means that the program is more deterministic. Now, uh, this uh, refinement relation is used um, in an idealistic um, development process for programs, which starts with a specification and gradually refines the specification to produce perhaps a series of designs, um, and eventually um, the process ends in a successfully um, uh, delivered program, which because the uh, whole design process has been supported by the mathematical um, basis of, of the algebra, 
is known by construction to be correct at the time when it is first submitted to the computer. Well, I, I've been an academic most of my life, and as an academic I felt free to pursue ideals which I should have known were impossible, although um, I'm afraid I, I didn't. Coming to work for industry, I now realize that they're impossible, but nevertheless very important, uh, because research science is driven by idealism. It's not driven by the profit motive, and therefore um, we must cultivate the ideals of scientists in the hopes that they produce lovely ideas which can then be exploited commercially, or in other ways. Now, um, also since joining Microsoft, I realized that program analysis, which starts with the program and tries to work out aspects of its behavior, is uh, in practice going to be, at least in the short term, much more important than the idealism, idealism of correctness by construction. And that's just the reverse process. To using the same operator of refinement, same comparative operator, to start with the program and somehow postulate what design that program is, is, is uh, conforming to, and maybe even aspects of the specification of that program. So that, that justifies why we use an ordering um, to, as the basic algebraic operator. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, um, the mathematicians always use a lot of different words. Almost any pair of words involving a comparative, um, like bigger or better or greater or weaker or upper or lower or more or less or included, all of these words are used to mean to denote um, a relationship between what stands on the uh, left-hand side of the refinement relation and on the right-hand side. Um, and I shall probably follow the same um, uh, practice. So, um, let's start with the, some of the basic algebraic laws. That refinement is a partial order, which you probably know means that it's transitive, it's anti-symmetric, and reflexive. Um, why do we do this? Um, how do we know that these laws are actually true? That's the wrong question. In algebra, you don't know what you're talking about, even. So the question about whether it might be true or not would be irrelevant. As long as it's true of something, you don't... Well, yes, I think so. Um, the, um, but we do know what you're talking about, <clears throat> and therefore we can ask, is it, is it true? Are, the, are the, these algebraic properties of the ordering of the relation actually true? That's the wrong question too. Do we want them to be true? That's the right question. Because algebra is about postulating laws. It's not about proving them. Um, and therefore you need to be motivated to want the law to be true rather than actually believe it to be true. Yes? You, you need the correct definition of equality. Since P is an even prime and P equals 2 clearly imply each other, they're not the same statement in English or in the mass but textbook. Yes, but they're describing the same thing. Yes. And I'm always going to concentrate on the thing that I'm describing rather than just the description of it. That's, that's being an applied, ma applied mathematician, of course. Thank you. So we want them to be true. Um, if, um, if the uh, refinement relation wasn't a partial order, we couldn't use it for the stepwise development and or analysis, as I described in the last um, program. We've got to make sure of the link between the program and the specification at the two ends of the chain and establish that link by just checking that each smaller link is actually uh, valid. Um, Anti-symmetric means that two things which can be refined from each other actually describe the same thing. Um, that's in order to bring in an element of abstraction into our reasoning. 
And reflexive, I think, is, is a matter of convenience. Um, unless anybody can think of a good reason why the thing has to be reflexive. One could have worked with an irreflexive order. It doesn't matter very much. I find the reflexive one more convenient. So now let's start talking about uh, programs, um, programming languages and descriptions and specifications. One of the fundamental operators of a programming language is sequential composition. Uh, denoted by semicolon. And that's what I intend to mean by semicolon uh, when I write it between two program descriptions. Um, informally, um, uh, and when I construct a model of the algebra, I'm going to ensure that, uh, state that each execution uh, described by P semicolon Q consists of two parts, can be split into two parts, um, the first part of which consists of all events from X, all events from an execution of P, and the second part consists of an execution of Q. Um, and um, uh, those events are distinct from each other and subject to an ordering constraint um, that uh, reflects the fact that uh, P, in some sense, comes before Q. But I'm not going to tell you exactly what that ordering constraint is. I'm going to suggest some possible meanings for it. Um, for example, the strong meaning could say all events X from P must precede all events from Q. In other words, P must finish before Q starts. And a lot of people, a lot of people think that that is what uh, semicolon means in a programming language. But people who actually write compilers for computers such as this uh, know that that isn't what it means. It actually means something a little weaker than that. It says no event from Q, the second operand, can precede any event from P. But they could occur at the same time. The events at the beginning of Q could occur at the same time as events from, um, uh, from the end of P, provided, of course, that they don't um, affect the same variables in the memory. Um, there are two, uh, uh, there's another distinction that you can draw whether the sequential composition is interruptible or not, whether it's possible for other threads to interfere between uh, the execution of P and the execution of Q, or whether the interrupts are, as it were, inhibited uh, during the uh, transition between P and Q. All I want to say is that our algebraic laws are going to apply equally to each of those four cases. And so I don't have to tell you which because all I'm interested in is the abstraction that the algebraic law makes from the details of the way in which sequential composition is implemented. Ah. Seen that part? <laughs> come to something more familiar. I'm actually going to define, I mean, in 1969, I didn't know any better, and I uh, postulated this as a primitive of the reasoning about programs, and a lot of people have followed that example. But now I'm going to define it algebraically as just the statement that um, P composed sequentially with Q refines R. Um, and one could read that as uh, saying that starting in the final state of an execution of P, Q will end in a final state of some execution of R. You see, P and R maybe will be mostly assertions, in fact, post conditions, uh, because we're talking about the end of execution. Um, but there's no reason in the algebra why they should be post conditions any specification, any program will do. So we can describe the initial state of Q by just writing a program P that will bring a machine into that initial state. Um, there's complete flexibility. Expressive power of the whole programming language can be used to actually specify preconditions, postconditions, and other aspects of specifications. Here's a little example. Um, we have the usual example, x becomes x plus 1, and um, in the brackets on the left we have 
um, an execution that ends with x plus 1 equal or less than n. And the r on the right says that x is equal or less than n. Ah, some more laws. Um, semicolon is monotonic with respect to refinement. Um, does everybody, uh, the definition of monotonicity is given in the next two lines. Uh, one saying that the semicolon is monotonic in its first argument, and the other one in saying that it is um, uh, monotonic in its second argument, except I should have... Uh, should have scrubbed out these uh, flashes there. Yes, yes. Algebra is nice and simple, and, and the only errors you have are the obvious ones. Well, this is a property that uh, is shared with if, so if, if uh, P and Q were numbers and semicolon was plus, then monotonicity holds for normal arithmetic addition. So it's a familiar property. The um, um, rule of consequence uh, was one of the very first rules that I put forward for the calculus of Hoare triples. And I've quoted that. It says that if you weaken the precondition or strengthen the, uh, sorry, if you strengthen the precondition or weaken the postcondition, the um, triple is still true. Um, and I thought that was uh, very... Um, that actually follows from um, um, the first law. Uh, now, would anybody like to count the number of symbols in that first law and the number of symbols here? The uh, free, free variables... Uh, number of free variables has gone up and the number of symbols has gone up. And if you look back at the definition of the uh, um, Hoare triple, you'll see that there are actually more symbols in the thing that, that was defined rather than the mathematical meaning which I'm giving it here. So it's very unusual in, a, in, in mathematics to see a... Um, uh, to define something which actually takes more symbols than the expression that you're defining it in terms of. We normally think of definitions as being abbreviations, don't we? But in this case, I seem to have managed to not realize that. And I get my comeuppance that every theorem that I write is nearly twice as long as the algebraic law on which it is based. Well, that seems to me to have been something of a mistake. Certainly a result of ignorance, uh, not, was, not what I intended. So let's go on and um, postulate another law that the semicolon is associative. doesn't matter in which order you take the operands. Um, there is a similar law um, which... Um, uh, expresses how you prove the correctness of a um, uh, semicolon um, using four triples. Uh, and that, um, this law follows from half of that law. If you replace that equality by a refinement, you find that the law will improve this, will, approve, will prove this theorem and vice versa. You can derive uh, the uh, theorem from the law. So the, the, the um, uh, Hoare triple uh, rule for a sequential composition um, is not only nearly twice as long as the law from which it is derived, uh, but it's only half as powerful. Hmm. How does one get... Yeah. Slide, I do not understand the first one. Yes, it's well, a, there's, prime. there's a misprint. Ah, the prime. I, I tried to rub it out, but my finger wouldn't. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah.
the program that does nothing, skip, um, often called, and the important algebraic property of it is that it is a unit of uh, semicolon. And um, from this uh, law, I can prove that the standard uh, triple definition of the skip operation, it does nothing, so anything that was true before remains true afterwards. In this case, the law is only one quarter as powerful as the theorem. You can prove one inequation in one direction only uh, from, the, um, uh, from the theorem. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? Can we do the same thing for concurrent composition, where we have two threads operating in um, uh, uh, simultaneously, perhaps even on the same computer, perhaps even sharing the same store, perhaps communicating with each other, or whatever. And here, um, the intended meaning is that all events of an execution of each of the thread, threads uh, is included in the execution uh, when you um, uh, run them concurrently. Everything that happens is either attributed to the execution of a command inside P or to an execution of a command inside Q. There's nothing more, nothing less. But this time there's no constraint. They can occur, the events of P and the events of Q can occur, um, they can occur one after the other, or they can occur simultaneously, or they can occur concurrently, so that they run uh, during the same interval of time. Um, just as in the case of sequential composition, there's more than one possible meaning one could give to this operator. Um, for example, uh, does it mean um, um, concurrency on separate computers which don't share store or which do, cha do share store? Um, does it mean that um, the... Um, or is it implemented by interleaving, so that the, um, uh, uh, every event occurs either before or after um, an event of the other um, thread? I'm not going to say which of those it is, because the laws will apply to both of them. Uh, both of them are associative, commutative, and monotonic. Now, the way to, um, which has been suggested for reasoning about concurrency, um, is uh, a widely, a widely, um, uh, a widely known and, and a new technique for reasoning about concurrency is given by separation logic. And the most important property of separation logic is uh, one that I've written here, that if you've uh, proved a given triple then you can run something else in uh, concurrently with the precondition and the postcondition. Remember, these are precondition and postcondition are themselves uh, descriptions of uh, program execution. So we can uh, describe S running concurrently with R or with P. And this implication is the basis for the simplicity of reasoning about correctness in separation logic. If you translate, um, uh, you, can, you can actually translate this um, triple formulation back into the original algebra, you'll get a statement uh, which is, I've called left locality, which is a sort of distribution law um, showing how concurrency distributes into a sequential composition. It, it relates the two operators. It's a property of the relationship between um, sequential and concurrent composition, which is very similar to the distribution laws which re re relate addition and multiplication in conventional numerical algebra. So, um, but you actually distribute uh, this S to only one of the operands rather than the other. Um, it's equally true, uh, uh, you, you could have um, distributed it to the second operand rather than the first. Um, 
but that requires an additional um, axiom, a right locality. Now, the second law which um, separation logic allows is a sort of compositionality or modularity law which tells you that if you want to prove a, uh, the correctness of a sequential composition, then you should prove the correctness of the two operands of the sequential composition, and that enables you to conclude that the um, composition itself is correct. Um, and in this case, again, um, the uh, law implies the theorem, but in this case, the theorem also imp implies the law. If you want your um, uh, semicolon to be modular, you're sorry, if you want your uh, reasoning about concurrency to be modular, then you have to believe that law. There's not, it's not, uh, not optional. Um, and that's uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, but is it true? Is that law true? Is that the right question? Well, we want it to be true, don't we? Because we want to reason modularly. And if I were a pure algebraist, merely wanting the law to be true would be enough. But mm, not for an applied scientist. We really do need to find at least something of which that law is true. Um, well, this is an, um, uh, an active topic of research um, which I won't go into. I'll, I'll, I'll shortly give you an example. Meanwhile, let me just write out the um, uh, exchange law in a slightly different form, in a two-dimensional form, in which the P and the P dashed are distributed in this way. Now, if you um, read, the, uh, read this matrix horizontally, it reads uh, P concurrent with Q, all composed sequentially with P dashed concurrent with Q dashed. And um, if we um, go uh, to the next slide, we're reading, reading it by rows rather than by columns, that uh, P composed with P dashed, it's here, um, parallel, this one, with Q composed with Q dashed. So this, this law is really a sort of uh, asserting the two-dimensionality of uh, what um, um, uh, con concurrency gives us. Um, the, it's as though we are manipulating um, events, controlling events, not just uh, occurring in the single dimension of time, as we do in, in sequential programming, but also in the dimension of space. And uh, so things that are separated by the parallel occur, as it were, in a different place from those which are separated by, uh, from, the, from its two operands. Um, and the exchange law says you can transpose that matrix, that the two axes are to a certain extent orthogonal to each other. This is a rather um, hand-waving description, I'm afraid. Um, but it is difficult to see, um, understand the real inwardness of that uh, um, uh, exchange law. So let me get on to the uh, final question. Is, is it true? Or rather, as we put it um, uh, in the research, um, of what? Is there anything of which it is true? Well, what is it true of? And I'm going to end um, my talk with a claim that it is true of concurrency, or rather of interleaving, of uh, regular languages. So um, my P and Q and R are uh, descriptions of um, the execution of a finite state machine. Uh, it's a limited, a limited um, uh, machine for executing programs. Um, 
P refines Q means that the language, dis that the, 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 str the behavior of the machine is defined in terms of strings, and um, the um, uh, refinement means uh, that every string which could possibly be an execution of P is also an execution of Q, or rather, um, in other words, the, their languages are included. Um, the semicolon is the standard semicolon of regular expressions. It's the lifted concatenation of strings. And parallel queue is the interleaving of strings. A perfectly good um, uh, operator on, on regular languages because it preserves uh, finitude. Um, the empty string um, is the uh, unit of semicolon. And the... Um, individual characters of the alphabet of the machine are, are the um, uh, generators of the, of the algebra. The, um, but I, I won't be dealing with those. Um, so now I've got to show that the left locality law is true because I needed that to, to prove, the, um, uh, uh, prove the frame law of separation logic. So look at the uh, left-hand side. Um, you can see that uh, S interleaves just with P um, and all of Q comes afterwards. I've drawn a picture here. Here's all of Q coming afterwards and here is S interleaving with, um, uh, with P. Uh, in this case, P came first and then, then two, two possibly different symbols from S. On the right-hand side, um, there has been a little bit more interleaving because the S and the Q have uh, changed places. Um, so there are more interleavings on the right-hand side than there are on the left-hand side. And that's why it works. Another way of stating the truth, sort of more constructive. Supposing we were told, please find us an interleaving this one here, between S and P semicolon Q. One of the ways of finding such an interleaving is to um, decide first of all to have all of Q at the end and then to interleave S with P. So the refinement expresses the fact that one of the ways of implementing this specification is to take this as its design. And here's the exchange law. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but again, I can give you the informal explanation that um, the, um, uh, if you want to interleave um, two long strings, long sequential uh, strings, um, then one of the things you can do is you can split the first th string and split the second string and then interleave the first elements of the two, um, of the two operands uh, and follow that by interleaving the second element. So it is an interleaving in which the two semicolons occurring on the right-hand side have been um, synchronized. And to synchronize those two semicolons, it follows that the uh, left of that semicolon is an interleaving of the two left operands of the semicolon on the right hand side and similarly um, on the right hand side. Now it was quite a shock to me to discover that regular interleaving actually satisfies the same law, same laws as separation logic because um, the whole purpose of separation logic is to avoid interleaving. Interleaving is, uh, interleaving is our race conditions and those are the things we want to avoid and yet to reason about interleavings we use exactly the same reasoning principles same algebraic laws as we do for, for um, uh, truly separate um, threads. Where are we going? So, I haven't gone through all the details but the conclusion is that regular expressions satisfy all our laws for refinement, sequential composition, skip, 
and interleaving. And actually, for many of the other operators that I won't have time to introduce later. Well, I hope, if you don't believe any of the details of what I've been talking about, you will go away with the impression that I am extremely impressed by the power of algebra. Um, the algebraic laws have turned out to be much more simple than the, uh, what I was originally familiar with, the, the Hoare triple. Um, they're reusable. I can use the same laws and the same theorems based on them for many different operators and for many different languages. Uh, and many different operators within the same language. Um, they are unifying in the sense that I've just described and indeed in another sense because whole triples aren't the only way of describing the semantics of a programming language. There are um, operational semantics. There are, well, there are two versions of whole triples, one of them for total correctness and the other one for partial correctness. And they're different. And they have different algebraic definitions. And there are at least two different kinds of operational semantics which um, are due to Plotkin and, and used by Milner, um, which actually describe how to execute a program. And those, those presentations of the semantics are, uh, of course, more useful for actually implementing the language um, than the deductive presentation uh, which is given in Hoare logic. And in order for a practical programming language, really, well, it, it must have an operational semantics. It must be operational. You must be able to execute the program so there isn't any point in it. And it's nice also to be able to prove that the programs are correct, even if you never actually do it. So what we need is a combination of um, deductive um, proof methods for um, establishing the properties of programs and inductive uh, methods of actually executing the programs which we hope we now believe to be correct. Um, they can all, all these forms of semantics can be derived from the algebra that I've shown you and the algebra of other operators which I haven't, ha haven't had time to show you <coughs> and vice versa. If you take the conjunction of all the forms of semantics and prove the thing backwards you can prove all the laws of the algebra from four different versions of programming language semantics. But the algebra is much simpler and much shorter than four different complete semantic presentations of uh, semantics of a language. So algebra is abstract. I think we've seen that. And I hope I've uh, managed to convey uh, some part of the uh, my admiration for the elegance of some of the algebraic formulations. Thank you very much. Fifty-nine, fifty-six, fifty-nine, one hour exactly. <laughs> Have you done some part of the algebra? For example, uh, you have uh, the order introduce a lattice structure. Yes. You never spoke about uh, going to infinite formulas and things like that, the limits of formulas and so on. So when I have a group from Google, I have to have a formula to the iteration, to the iteration, to pass to the limit and all the things. So you will need some form of induction. Wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> I don't like induction very much. Induction is life for mathematicians. Well, actually, um, induction depends on an exclusion. I think uh, perhaps I could make uh, uh, two uh, observations from what you said. The first one is um, that. I'm very glad that you raised this point because it shows that if you're interested in taking things further, uh, Patrick will be able to enlighten you. You have, just, 
You've described, sure. <laughs> you've described the content of my second lecture. <laughs> um, the second thing is that one of the nice things about algebra is its incrementality. That I can tell you a lot, a, a great deal, well not everything, but a great deal about semicolon and interleaving and refinement and I don't have to mention whether it's a lattice ordering or not. And simply by adding a new axiom or a new operator to my algebra together with an associated axiom or definition, um, I can extend my language um, without changing anything that has gone before. And this is really, I think, uh, an essential criterion for uh, progress in science, that, that it builds on what has gone before rather than overthrowing it. Well, sometimes it needs overthrowing, but, but a building is the normal thing to do for a scientist. And uh, the, the ability to, to um, uh, build on not just the foundations, but the theorems, uh, the, the first and second floors can be standard, and then you can add new things without invalidating anything that's gone before. If you use too much induction, particularly induction on the syntax, you can't do this because an induction depends on limiting the range of operators or numbers or objects that you're dealing with so that you can deal with them by cases. Um, so that I think there's a very, very important point about algebra here. And I, I can say some very rude things about the other forms of semantics. Um, you, I expect you've seen at least 4,000 different languages defined using operational or deductive semantics. Every one of them, as far as I know, may be wrong, quotes every law that it uses, every, every rule that it proposes, and reproves every theorem that it needs. And that is why maybe our subject is not progressing as fast as it should. Algebra is marvelous. Sorry. I have a question. On, when you see the, the laws and how they um, simplify things, what lessons um, or um, conclusions do you draw about what we should do in programming languages for, to get the same simplifications or the same reasoning power? Well, I, I, I didn't know that. Um, what I found in, in, in recent years, when I was an, an academic, I used to say, well, you shouldn't be using programming languages that, that go beyond what I know how to prove. And since joining Microsoft, I've realized that this um, is an untenable position. <laughs> but as a result, I've learned an enormous amount. All this stuff about concurrency arises out of the fact that it's needed. And um, so by studying what actually is, and I mean what is in the languages that people actually use, um, I managed, I think, to extend uh, the range of the um, research into the principles of programming. So I, I think there's a lot in current practice and current languages uh, from which a quite theoretical um, in interesting theoretical areas of, of research can be can be derived. Um, if I believed that um, there would be a lot of new programming languages invented in this world um, and and then used by others people other than their inventors, uh, then I would suggest that one uses the algebra as a tool for discussing the programming language design. And since I don't believe that many new, new programming languages will be designed, I will apply the same principles to programs, to APIs, to protocols, to um, uh, any other human interface which the um, uh, programmer uh, wishes to offer or sell uh, to his colleagues. Uh, try to formulate, try to discuss the way you the way you discuss your design of an API in terms of its algebraic properties. It just gives you a medium for considering alternatives. 
And when you've chosen the alternatives, you might be very kind to explain to your potential users what they are. Certainly, if you're going to build tools uh, that are going to analyze uh, the programs which used your, your constructions, then uh, you're going to need some theory um, on which to base those tools. And the tools could be quite important to get it, getting your um, designs accepted and, and, and used reliably uh, by people who, um, if they don't understand what your interface does, um, at least um, could in principle understand it by, by reading the, reading the uh, laws. No, I, I would welcome it. Um, when you do have to make a distinction, you have to make a distinction. And you say, I'm afraid this doesn't mix, well, the details don't mix uh, with some other uh, branch of the, of the subject. <coughs> Unification is not, is not cramming everything into the same basket. It, 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 it's welcoming the branching structure of the subject and basing the, um, the structure on, the, as it were, the inner logic of the mathematics involved and explaining it and making it completely clear what the implications of making a decision uh, to, to go down one branch or the other are going to be. So the pattern uh, of a mathematical textbook that you've very eloquently described and very faithfully described is one that I would love to see reproduced when talking about the principles of programming. Can you model procedure columns in your algebra? What does that look like? Well, um, um, ideally, it sort of um, all of um, mathematics involves procedure calls. You just define something, and then you um, uh, then you use it. Um, so there's. Uh, one would prefer to avoid having to model the implementations of para parameter passing mechanisms if that's yeah, I, I what you if want. You can somehow model it abstractly as, as an operator, you know, A, A calls B, something like that. Is it, or, you know, can semicolon do that? No, um, there, there is um, clearly a, a uh, um, declarations not only of procedures but of variables that need to be included in the language. Um, and I think specifications, interfaces too. Um, one of the nice things I discovered recently was a way of, of um, implementing the um, uh, uh, requires and, and ensures uh, of Boogie um, as an operator of the language that um, uh, delivers a, uh, an explicit pr um, error message, as, as it were, um, if the uh, program doesn't meet its specification, um, but which enables the uh, user of the, uh, the, the uh, person who calls the procedure to assume that it satisfies the specification and allows the implementer to use the body of the procedure to actually implement it. So just a little operator with uh, algebraic properties based on, on um, uh, at least up, uh, greatest lower bounds in this case. I think in the operator that you didn't show us, uh, do you have uh, negation? And that's, that's, that's <laughs> a very good discussion. Oh. We discussed about uh, the fundamental distinction, perhaps, on your program and specification, especially a logical specification. Yes. You have negation in logic, but yes. in programs. Yes, I think the the um, uh, that's that's a very good 
very good point. Uh, in specification, it's very often, very, really essential to have very simple concepts like and, or, and not. But in programs, there is a very good reason for not allowing not. It's incomputable. Um, there's a very good reason for not having non-determinism, because it makes testing impossible. Um, so we get sequential languages which are deterministic. And certainly, we don't have, we don't have not. Um, and in fact, there are other, um, the, 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 so it turns out that the programs are really a subset of um, specifications. And it's very interesting to, to um, uh, determine the algebraic properties of that subset. It has, because it's a subset, it has more interesting algebraic properties than general specifications. So in some ways, it, it's a good thing that programs are a special case. Um, but uh, it certainly um, means that um, uh, it, well it actually means that the process of program design from specification actually has some significance it means you've got a specification which is as clear as you can make it using concepts like and or and not um, and then you've got to somehow massage that specification into a form that doesn't use and or or not but only operators like semicolon and, and concurrency and so on and that that's what programming is all about in principle in principle thank you um, what do you make of uh, programming languages based on constructive logics and constructive type theories in which the language of specifications and programs are indeed conflicted and yes. uh, things like not exist both at the level of specifications and at the level of programs. I wasn't aware that not existed at the level of programs, but... Um, not being just a, uh, uh, a function that takes uh, a, a proof of the proposition that you want to prove and it transforms. Yes. I mean, it essentially collapses the program into false. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, well, I have a great admiration for them, clearly. Um, uh, they, they tend to restrict the programming language in ways that, at least for Microsoft, is unrealistic because it's a pure functional programming language. And um, nearly every program written by Microsoft is non-deterministic. It's not, not even a function. Um, quite apart from the fact that the, the very essence of what Microsoft deals with, and indeed a lot of other software, is involves time and space. Trading off between time and space is what programmers these days has, have to do. And, and functional programs are marvelous because you don't have to do it. As a result, we can't use functional programs for everything. They aren't always purely functional, but you can still accommodate state inside these frameworks and concurrence. But that's just another discussion. I think that's another. It's a very funny thing about functional programming. People get quite, quite enthusiastic about it. Um, but when you come down to it, they all put procedural um, features into their implementations. Just the way that Fortran did. I mean, Fortran loves functions. It included functions way back in 1956. 56. Thank you. Thank you. You remember that last time. <laughs> it was before my time. <laughs> it's just that they, they describe these things um, in, 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 in different ways. Um, an enthusiastic Fortran programmer can say, yep, yes, you've got functions, and you should use them whenever you can. And the functional programmer puts the procedural facilities into his language and says, mm, yes, it's got procedural facilities, but you should avoid them whenever you can. <laughs> and I agree with both of those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.